Hi, I'm Tuan Lee. I'm a Vietnamese Korean American CPG founder based here in Los Angeles. My company is a sparkling farm to can craft cocktail company called Vervet. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. Thanks, Tuan. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you nowadays? Oh, boy. You know, I think for, for myself, um, that's an ever-evolving uh, notion. You know, um, to be a Vietnamese American when I was a teenager in my 20s and 30s and now my 40s has changed in each particular decade, mostly because, you know, as I learn more um, about Vietnamese culture and history without the filters of external groups, you know, people who are not uh, Vietnamese or Vietnamese American, um, you know, you gain more information. And I think that collective intelligence continues to to evolve my definition of what it means to be a Vietnamese American now. You know, um, it's a, I see it kind of like a living document. It's, a, I am a living document. It really changes, you know, for me um, as a Vietnamese American, what I'm trying to do um, in my everyday life and practicing the values of my identity is that I really try to portray it um, as genuinely as possible, you know, and, and have it to be aspirational. And that's what I'm doing right now. What does it mean to be Korean American to you? What about that second half or the first half? Well, um, I can tell you what it feels like to be Korean American right now. And which is, I think something that um, is new in, in the last decade, particularly the last five years, it feels really great to be Korean American. Um, Korean culture has overtaken not just America, but the globe. Um, people from outside of the Korean culture are so interested um, in the Korean language and food entertainment and music and styles um, so much so that many are moving there and wanting to learn the language and and study it um, telling people that I'm Korean American just has people have so many questions you know they want to learn so much I I kind of I kind of feel like what it is it's like wow this is this is what it's like to be like British American or, or French American, Italian American. I didn't expect this to, growing up, I didn't expect this to happen. Um, so that's what it feels like to be Korean American. Um, what it means, I think, is, you know, I, I just like being Vietnamese American. It's, it's the don't knowing the difference between Korean, being Korean and being Korean American. You know, uh, there's a lot of overlap. But there's also, as a, a Venn diagram in two circles, there's, there's some areas that don't overlap, you know? So, and again, um, that's also a, a moving target, you know, that continues to grow and change and shift. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's very apparent in Vietnam, you know, when you go to Saigon and there's a thriving Vietnamese Korean sort of community I mean, it's outright Korean. There's a Korean district uh, and there's there's a lot of Korean uh, people who are doing business in Vietnam. And a lot of the kids now, you know, out at the malls look like Korean pop stars. You know, it's it's a it's a very interesting phenomenon. Yeah, you're talking about in, in Vietnam? Yes, in Vietnam. Yeah, the history between the two countries are, you know, it's pretty amazing. Uh, it's, you know, they've, they've been tied together for a while. I don't know how well known that is, but um, Korean soldiers were definitely involved in South Vietnam's efforts. And, you know, at that time, you know, Korea was pretty poor um, and being able to work with the American government 
um, and providing soldiers provided a lot of revenue um, for the country of Vietnam. You know, much of that money was spent on building a lot of the infrastructure. Um, but at that same time, and that was kind of began the combining these two peoples and communities. Um, there's just like you mentioned, there's a Korean community there too. And when I was in Seoul last year, there's, there's a Vietnamese community um, in, in Seoul as well. Wow. There's many similarities between the two countries in the, for the, in the last century. How did your mom and dad meet? Well, so uh, because of that business interest, uh, my, my dad was a civilian um, in Vietnam. And again, he was there looking for economic opportunities. Um, so he, there was a, a pretty sizable group of Korean American businessmen uh, who traveled to Vietnam during the war effort, um, you know, to start various businesses. You know, my dad was providing all sorts of commodities to the, the military effort, t-shirts, bread, you know, whatever he could do, you know, he could um, provide supplies and, and food and, and other items. And so he was there in Saigon doing business. And my mom was, had left her hometown of Dalat, you know, um, as a young woman and as a young adult in Vietnam, like many do, they go to the big city for opportunities. And my mom was working in Vietnam. I, she was a bank teller. And that's how her, my father and her met. Um, and, you know, fell in love, got married and started a family. So your father, how did he get into Vietnam? I mean, as um, a Korean national, right, from South Korea, he, did he have background in Vietnamese? Did he study the culture? Did he speak English? Like how does a Korean person in the 70s arrive in Vietnam during the war? So that was, much of it was set up uh, through the, the, the two governments and with the, the American government too as well. Uh, because of that effort, they, were, they had a allied goals. And so you just filed the paperwork. There was a, a Korean embassy in, in Saigon. Um, so it was done with the arrangement of all the cooperating governments. And then, you know, just he traveled by boat. Um, to Vietnam and he did not speak Vietnamese and he did not know anything about the culture. So it was, he just, just kind of crashed, crashed in. Is he still living today? Um, unfortunately, no, we, we lost my father, uh, May of 2020 recently. Oh, okay. So he, did he ever actually get to go back to Vietnam? Um, no, he never did. Uh, sadly enough. And I know that's something that he wanted to do. Uh, but you know, he, he wasn't able to do that. That, that would have been a fascinating, um, conversation to see what the difference was in the seventies, uh, versus today and how, uh, Korean culture has influenced the, the, you know, the big cities in, in Vietnam. Absolutely. Absolutely. He would have, he would have loved the trip. Yeah. That's, that's too bad. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that uh, you lost him in 2020. Uh, thank you. So as I'm reading about uh, the things that you've done in your life, what I'm constantly reminded about when I'm doing these interviews is uh, this idea of range. People who start these businesses rarely, I mean, really rarely come into these sort of things, just doing whatever they're doing. Like, it's rare that you meet somebody who started a beverage company who came up in the beverage industry. It's always like things that people sort of like live through uh, tangentially and they sort of like, you know, uh, fall into their their calling as a result of doing many things. Um, and I think that you kind of fall into that uh, that category, right? I guess I'm 1.5 gen. So, um, you know, I I wasn't coming here, you're, I'm an outsider from on, on, on all respects, you know, including a career and job opportunities and entrepreneurial opportunities. So I'm very grateful for all the barriers I've been able to go through, get around or 
you know, manage to, to mitigate them, you know, to some degree. Entering this space here is food and beverage is something I'm very, very passionate about, um, you know, and been so for quite a long time. And you're right, there is Asian American founders when it comes to, to, to premium booze, I don't know. I think we're less, we're definitely less than 3%. And uh, the irony is like, we know each other. Most of us know each other because there's so few of us. Um, so imagine someone who's a, you know, 1.5 gen being able to do this, you know, have this opportunity. Um, it's a privilege that, you know, many immigrants don't have, you know, maybe their children or their children's children will eventually do. So, and because of that, I feel like that's why the brand and the company is just so intentional. Be able to have this opportunity means for me that I could truly um, construct a brand and a company on my personal values that have shaped my life, being a Vietnamese Korean American um, and be an aspirational model, not just for our own communities, but for others as well. What, what kind of adverse experiences uh, are you talking about? Well, I mean, for, for one, I, you know, you know, first decade of life. Um, well, that's when I learned I wasn't white, right? As a kid, you learned that pretty quick. Where, where did you um, learn that you weren't white? Well, so after we, so we, you know, left Vietnam, you know, obviously the country fell and we went to Busan where my dad is from and my parents split up there. And so my mom ended up coming to the United States as a refugee. And uh, we ended up in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where I grew up and went to uh, went to grade school. But yeah, that's that's where I learned I was the only uh, Asian American, and of course I was the only Vietnamese Korean American, you know, as well. So it was yeah, I learned real quick, first day of kindergarten. So it was um, very that was a, a a very painful realization process so that's that's when it was i mean i have this belt belt buckle i still keep with me like i almost became tony you know as a part of like this is from my stepdad's family like this campaign you know like what, to, what uh what prevented you from becoming tony you know it wasn't me because I'll tell you what, like at that time I was like, yeah, please like, you know, make me white. Like, let's start with my name, you know? Um, so it wasn't me. I don't get the credit. It was my mom. Mm. I, you know, I, you know, I, I, I love my mom so much. We're very close. And um, somehow she managed to do that, you know, against all odds. There was a lot of pressure on her, you know, it was just, my mom came here by herself. She didn't have the support of her parents and her family, all of her siblings, her brothers and sisters. Um, and she married into this, this white family. And um, to this day, like, I'm just so grateful that she managed to hold her ground and, um, you know, didn't let the legal process, my legal name change go through or, Oftentimes you don't even go through the legal name change, but you just use it like on all of your, for example, your school papers, when you're, you're entering yeah. a new grade, you just simply say, Tony, you know, and uh, that didn't happen. Um, so, you know, she's the reason. You know, when we say uh, Tuan, your name, it's um, typically, I, you know, many, the big percentage is Tuan, Right. And I've heard Tuan and, you know, different w ways to pronounce. But you pronounced it Tuan when you got on the in the introduction. Um, yeah, Tuan. And, you know, I think that's the closest to the Vietnamese production pronunciation. It's close. It's much closer than Tuan, you know. So I think a lot of people in the States were are, are more accustomed with, you know, Spanish style of pronunciation because of the word one I mean when I was in grade school I when I started you know writing my name I had a teacher change they thought that I couldn't write the letter j so they corrected the t to a j so it was uh um but you know that that just shows the impact of you know um you know yeah. latin culture you know yeah. particularly mexican-american culture you know already in the midwest but yeah so I've held on to two in as sort of 
I guess, the best way to pronounce it if you're not a speaker. Now, gr growing up um, in the Midwest, you had uh, arguably three cultures to sort of figure out, right? You, the, your mother's culture, your father's culture, and this new American culture. So I, and I, along with my friends talk about the third culture, like we're third culture kids, but you're not a third culture kid, you're a fourth culture kid. How did you navigate around all that? Um, <laughs> I didn't poorly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, growing up there in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, it was a, um, a suburb, actually, it was actually a suburb, you know, uh, fluorescent, you know, uh, the, Fluorescent was a result of white flight from the inner city. So it was overwhelmingly white. And um, I think for me, it was like, I think many of us, you know, in the diaspora who grew up in communities like this throughout the Midwest and smaller towns, you know, my mom did her best to, you know, practice the Vietnamese culture, but only within the home, right? And behind closed doors, it's nothing that was ever visible. You know, um, and of course, mostly that that cultural practice was food, which I loved. But, you know, I was very, I, you know, I was very aware not to be, quote, Vietnamese outside of the home. Um, and then it, it got so bad, I think, at one time, sort of like the internalized racism, you know, that, you know, I was embarrassed to be Vietnamese. So how I navigated all those cultures was completely avoiding admitting to myself that I was Vietnamese and let alone Korean. I mean, my father wasn't around at that time. So the, we, that wasn't really an issue. Mm. So, um, so that's how I navigated it is simply leaning into assimilation as much as possible as, you know, an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, you know, growing up. Um, and, and really adopting the culture as much as you can, just short of changing how you look, but wishing that you could. <laughs> yeah, I I hope that in a few more months or years that I don't have to talk about this anymore. I can just talk yeah. about, right? And it's yeah. like, I think um, in an interview with um, Ocean Vuong, he talked about this idea of like radical okayness, right? Like we we should not, have to put the pressure on being normalized or you know we shouldn't have this problem of like just feeling okay with you know who we are we should just we should just have beauty regardless of who or where we come up from oh my gosh you're absolutely right you and ocean that conversation yes absolutely the weight should not be on our shoulders yes yeah you know and you know you think about Many of the social justice movements uh, that have inspired ours, you know, even if it's the feminist movement, the weight shouldn't have been on women, you know, the to for their identity, for their gendered identity to be accepted, right? Yeah. Um, so the um, and 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 like that, it's it shouldn't be on our shoulders either. It you know, um, it's for culture at large to be not just okay with who we are, but to celebrate it in the way that we do. Um, very much the same way that I practiced that for my white friends growing up, you know? They never had to defend the fact that they had German heritage or exactly. Irish or British or French or Italian or Spanish, you know? Um, it was always, you know, they always came at me as like aspirational, you know? I remember going into the homes of many, many of my friends and meeting the parents and they would so proud, they'd be so proud and rightfully so, you know, this is our family heritage. This is where, where we come from. And um, there was, you know, at that time there was really, you know, they were experiencing a culture where they were embraced, you know, there is a large diversity of whiteness, <laughs> you know, so to speak, you know, happening at that time. Um, and I think we're beginning to see that happen for the Asian ecosystem. I think people are beginning to realize how many different countries there are and knowing the difference between those. Um, 
And in seeing where Korean and Japanese culture is where they're headed and what they've been able to accomplish, um, you know, I, I fully expect that to, to continue and with the, the other Asian cultures too as well. So yeah, I agree. Your timeline yeah. is great. In a few months, let's, yeah, let's just, move on. And let's move on. on. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you, these kids, especially young men who are probably, you know, 18, 20 year old Korean kids who are growing up in SoCal today, those guys, they have the life, right? I mean, if you think about it, you know, their they're, they're, Korean culture is, I mean, how much consumption is happening on Netflix for Korean um, content and just having, you know, I went to a BTS concert, you know, when they were in town here, I went to the last night's uh, show and just sitting in the bleachers for me, sitting in the, the, the audience and then walking out after the show, I felt maybe three inches taller. And, you know, that I can't imagine what it does for a young 15 year old boy, you know, or you know, they probably don't even have to think about it. That's the radical okayness of it all. They don't have to even register some, you know, guys our age in our forties having to, you know, really put up with this bullshit that we had to go through. But then now I'm going to ask this question and I ask this all the time with my close friends. Do you think that it was better? I mean, now you look back and you see that there's two ways of kind of experiencing America. Was it better that we got to taste that and we have that imprinted on our on our mind and we can create something beautiful like these products from it? Or would you ra rather not have gone through it? That's an unfair question, but I mean. Yeah, well, <laughs> it is, but this is what I, okay, let me, how do, how do, I, how do I break this down? Okay, I gained empathy um, from going through that, that, that very traumatic process right of you know rooted in, in racism um and that being able to to acquire um empathy is truly a gift and that empathy how that translated into everything that i do including my company um that's why it's not just a vietnamese brand that's why it's not just a korean brand it's very inclusive we celebrate many cultures on it um you know, we, we, we tried to, cause I know what it's like, you know, um, I would like to think if I didn't go through that, that I would still have a natural instinct and curiosity and drive to learn other people's history who have suffered and gained and still gained that empathy. That is the path I would have preferred. <laughs> so these, these young Asian Americans in this particular example, you know, Korean Americans and Korean American young guys and boys and like, yeah, they're very lucky and I hopefully they're practicing gratitude and understand that. Um, and still are able to have empathy. I think those are the true leaders uh, of the world. You know, if you're able to do that, you grew up having that type of identity privilege and you're still able to uh, gain empathy um, and understand and see others, you know, and, and understand what they're going through. It's beautiful that you just brought that up because whatever BTS went through as a group of seven, they practice that. They practice empathy and they practice that in heavy dosage because I think that's the, the biggest appeal of these seven, you know, young men is that they are so um, actualized in that way. They kind of understand that uh, where, however they come up, came up in the, their industry sector, they weren't people who were the the the, the chosen uh, a band. They were, you know, the outcast. The, it sounds like they were not, you know, in prime position to become who they are. And I think because of that, that empathy. Uh, that resounding empathy that they have today is very apparent. So it's very interesting that you bring that up. It's um, it's everything. It's key to, to sort of our kindness and our, ex our our existence as human beings. No, absolutely. Um, it's their value system. Yeah. Right. And that value system was established early on when they were 
just when they were just seeds when they were just beginning this and I really do respect them because they've continued to scale those values and to this effect would because you know that is so important that they're still scaling those values because they have global impact now so I definitely see them fully as a, a as an aspirational model they're really great what they're doing absolutely now vervet that's how we pronounce it right yeah you know it's uh we're not going to correct you though you know i mean if pe some people say brevet and and that's fine too you know um and whatever you know language accent that you might have it's you know there's fine there's there's not one way to say it you know um but yeah that's that's vervet it's named after uh vervet monkeys they love booze they love cocktails and when you're not looking they they'll steal your drink. So they're really, they're really cute and playful. That's what inspired the name. Where, where did you find that uh, fun fact? YouTube. So it was, uh, yeah. Do you think a lot of different monkeys given uh, a choice would pick uh, some boozy drink to, to, to throw down? I don't know. We looked for other monkeys and I'm sure it does happen, but it was definitely prevalent in, in vervet monkeys so much. So a, a study was funded, you know, of their, of their alcohol consumption behaviors because it mirrored um, human data so closely. Wow. But, you know, at the time, you know, I was to inspire the name, I was looking for other animals because I knew animals like, you know, the history of it is that as humans, we were watching animals like eat very ripe fruit that would mm -hmm. eventually ferment. The sugar would turn to alcohol and they would act silly. Um, so there's bears that do that. There's birds, you know, that do that as well. The waxwing bird. Um, but in this case, vervet really sort of seemed to make the most sense for us. So you put this, uh, this company together, but how did, what, what led to this? You know, um, I think so much of it was becoming an entrepreneur is a few things. Uh, let's, first of all, you know, right away is like all entrepreneurs are, have a financial goal, right? So that's something I think we all have in common. So yes, that's, that's just, you just have to accept that, but it's more than that. You know, I do agree when I began my entrepreneurial journey, the it first first advice, you know, what you hear all the time is if you're just doing this for money, it's likely it's going to fail. And I could not agree more. So, you know, because there's plenty of things I could have done for money, I could have started, up, you know, many other different types of companies and products and services that was just financially driven. Um, but I wasn't interested only in that. So, you know, I think entrepreneurs, at some point you just get done, you get tired of ranting, <laughs> just having such, you know, you know, you're just so upset about what you're seeing happening um, in the marketplace and in the culture. And you just, that's it. I'm going to, and that's what motivates you. I'm going to do it myself, you know, and that's exactly what happened, you know, on the financial side, I want to not only take care of myself, but I want to take care of my mom. Like if people who know me know what I want to do, I want to, obviously get her a place uh, in Vietnam, you know, so she can stay there as long as she likes throughout the year. She still has family there, you know. Um, but yeah, that rant became uh, the spark of an idea at the idea stage. You turn your rant and you begin plotting and planning um, of what you would do. What is your solution? And uh, I think in 2016, you know, living here in Los Angeles, like on the brand side, I was just seeing what was happening. Like this is an LA brand and I, it was so exclusive, you know, it was largely, you know, uh, white hipsters for white hipsters and LA, you know, is an incredibly diverse place. And how could you just invisibilize <laughs> everyone else? And then also, um, take ideas from all these other cultures and not include them in a meaningful way. And I don't mean as models on your Instagram page, you know, I could really, I don't really give, give a shit about that. You know, I yeah. mean, meaningful, you know, in the company, you know, um, elevated uh, positions, you know, some equity ownership um, integrated into the brand, 
you know, so that was a big driving force, you know, of wanting to become an entrepreneur. We're seeing um, in the last few years, two, three years, a proliferation of Asian owned uh, beverage companies, um, yourself, and there's some Kai Jin, there's a Suti Distillery, there's um, the Win Coffee um, brand. There's so many, um, but you could have picked something else. I mean, because you're producing, you're a photographer, you could have picked another sort of niche to get into, to produce and to, to make, um, to make waves, uh, in terms of culturally, but why specifically drinks? Why booze? Okay. Why booze? That's, yeah. Well, I think we, we love craft cocktails. There's three founders and we, we all share that interest deeply, um, you know, over beer, over wine of all this sort of like, um, you know, you know, alcoholic beverages out there, craft cocktails are just there's a level of storytelling and craft um, and so many different components that goes in and you get to blend this together and have different experiences, textures and colors, uh, mouthfeel, but it's the storytelling and the connection to agriculture, how it's connected. Um, so that, you know, because of that interest and in what we knew, knew the best, that was, you know, we wanted it to be specifically cocktails in this case um and also for the added effect that because of the way the brand was coming together which is about celebrating many cultures and you know this inclusivity like what brings drinks are designed for exactly that to bring people together so i couldn't imagine a better vehicle um to celebrate the brand vision than good ass drinks you know <laughs> to bring people together um and that really, you know, became sort of a, a powerful defining glue that really brought it all together. I've read a few um, articles on what you've done and your co-founders. And I think a resounding sort of ethos is the no shortcuts path to formula, to figuring out what you're putting into this stuff. Um, I think that's for me, the biggest differentiator that I've, I've felt uh, as I'm looking into the work that you're, you're doing. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, you know, you hear the word disruption a lot when you become an entrepreneur. And I think one of the ways to achieve a successful disruption is, you know, avoid the status quo, which avoiding the status quo means you're also not taking shortcuts because by doing, the practicing the status quo of, yeah, that's a shortcut. That's a shortcut to the market, right? Because the solutions are already there. However, the downside of that is you're going to have a product identical to the status quo. So that's not a disruption. Um, and then you put too much, in my opinion, you put, if you do that, you put too much pressure on the brand side to be disruptive. Um, and then, you know, you have to lean into this marketing story and create this um, fictional universe to differentiate your product from a brand point of view, but the product itself um, is misaligned, right? So your brand will be disruptive, but your product is status quo. And that's something that um, we wanted to avoid. And, uh, and at the same time, what we wanted to really do is how do we bring what we love about craft cocktails out from behind the bar and into this format? That was a puzzle. That was very, very difficult journey. And um, I think if you talk to my co-founders, yeah, they'll, you know, I think we still question, you know, the, the wisdom of that. It was really hard. What, what, what was hard about it? Well, so, so many craft cocktails, uh, especially, you know, um, use fresh juice, you know, so the, um, and how do we, how do we bring that incredible flavor experience to this, to the can format without using lab made flavors, right? Because that's what you would normally do. Fresh raw juice uh, spoils very, very quickly. It's not stable. Obviously, when you're at a craft cocktail bar, you get to consume that product um, 
you know, right away. There's right. shelf life is not an issue, but in this format it is. So that was, um, that's, a, you know, once we came up with the solution in craft cocktails, there's something called, you know, clarified cocktails. Clarification is a really cool process that many bar programs do. Um, you just essentially, you remove a lot of the solid material, which has no flavor value. It's just solid material. And then you're just left with this beautiful clarified liquid. You get all the flavor. And, but in doing so, you're increasing the stability. So once we had that solution in place, it's, it's the labor intensiveness of it all, of filtering that volume of, uh, of, of liquid, you know, once we started scaling up. So it was very hard. And it also for bitters, vermouth and Amaro, bartenders are accustomed, you know, you're reaching for an end product. It's already bottled, you measure it out, you know, for us, that wasn't the case. So we had to make our own. And that was a, a learning process and lots of R&D, uh, learning how to infuse for, for this and how to, you know, it's like infusion is basically step proofing. So you can begin with very high proof alcohol, 180, 190 proof. And some you infuse at 120 or 100 proof and just yep. learning, learning the steps and when to do so. Now, when you, I've, I think I've asked this in many moons ago to somebody else, but I'm still not clear when people say infuse, like, I just think of just putting two, two things together and there you go. You got, a, you got a fusion of two, two different, uh, liquids or whatever. What does that really mean? You're basically, you, you just, it's as simple as that. You combine two elements together. One, um, one behaves as the extractor. One element behaves as the extractor and the other one is providing the value. So when we infuse um, the extractor uh, component is, uh, is the, the alcohol. So we have 190 proof spirit. And when we introduce Saigon cinnamon, uh, the Saigon cinnamon gives and the alcohol is pulling, you know, just of the, the, the characteristics of the material. So it's pulling that flavor out, but 190 proof has a lot of extraction power. So dry material in roots and barks are really good at that, uh, at that level of proof. It's like super high heat, like a wok burner. Um, and then you know, we just learned as you step down and you dilute it with RO water, reverse osmosis water, uh, that 120 proof or one proof, 100 proof, you would introduce more delicate items and delicate botanicals. Oh, so interesting. You know, uh, Ron, I'll really t quickly touch on that whole idea of Saigon cinnamon. I I love to cook. I think you're, you're a big, uh, you, you love to cook as well. And when I've gone to look for um, baking uh, material, I've seen different types of cinnamon and I've always saw, I've always seen Saigon cinnamon. And what is, is that like a real thing? Like why would they brand uh, cinnamon as Saigon cinnamon? What's the root behind that? Yeah, from what I understand, it's, it's native uh, to our country and it grows there. And within that, um, that genus, there's many different types, right? Cassias and cinnamons grows from India to Vietnam. You know, it grows and they're all kind of have different qualities. It's like the basil family. Um, it's for, uh, for, for me, uh, as a part of my definition of what being a Vietnamese American is, what I wanted to do is make sure that I'm adding aspirational value and we wanted to celebrate it. We just don't say cinnamon and or I use cinnamon from maybe uh, an outsider's definition of what is a superior cinnamon. You know, I'm just coming out there. No, it's Saigon cinnamon. It's bomb as fuck. You know, it's like, it's super tasty. Um, and we use that in our recipe. And it's, it's, it's a, a, one of the, the feature flavors of our Amaro that we make. Um, it's Saigon cinnamon and orange peels and grapefruit peels, you know, and other things that are, you know, local to Southern California. But um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the inspiration um, is, you know, it, it natively grows in Vietnam. Now this idea of um, um, removing the solids, uh, that means that there is a, is it a heated process or is it just sort of a filtering? Like, what's the process of removing 
the solids to just leave back the the liquid form yeah absolutely so there's a lot of ways to clarify um you know at the at a very small scale 10 ounces 12 ounce behind the bar um there's a little tiny there's a mini centrifuge you can use you can use gravity filtration you know through uh various filtering media uh, you can also use agents uh, like gelatins that will grab the solid material and pull it down, and then you would draw off the top. There's also a freezing method. Uh, for us, for our current batch, uh, we use um, something called a plate filter. It's got 40 plates. It works with very high air pressure, and the raw material, the raw juice goes through all these 40 plates, um, and by the end, it reaches its dis nearly clear, beautiful liquid. Um, but eventually we hope to, there's commercial size centrifuges, which makes the process a lot easier. Um, and it's more sustainable too. You don't have to use all this filter media. And then our process right now, you can also have a lot of waste, but yeah, that's, that's clarification um, on a large scale. It's almost reminds me of clarif clarified butter, right? Um, it's, it, I, same thing. You remove the butter solids, right? And you're left with, um, yeah, this, this clarified butter with that lot of solids. And that means you can cook at it at a higher temperature, higher temperature because the solid materials won't burn. But when you say that the, uh, the flavor is more stabilized, are you saying that all of that solids that you remove really affect the, the shelf life of, of, of whatever uh, fruit juices that you have? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, you know, I'm not the person to talk to about the exact science of why that oxidation happens if you don't filter, but it does. Um, that's why a lot of bar programs, a lot of times they'll, they'll clarify their juice because you go through so much work, like juicing fruit, like is a lot of work. And to make sure that um, you get the most out of that effort, you clear, you can clarify it um, and your fresh juice will last longer for your drinks. Yeah, this is a truly uh, no shortcuts path. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we just re released our sake tonic too, and uh, we ended up making our own tonic syrup. You know, our recipe developer Hope just started R and Ding, um, and it's really, it's really, it's a very clever recipe, um, and a lot of work went into it. You know, before we can start scaling it, but you know, we we really. Um, you know, hold in high regard all the, the work of the craft cocktail movement. Um, and we really want to bring that out authentically as much as we can. We really want to pay our respects. And at the same time, um, you know, we're practicing hospitality, you know, which means, you know, we care about that customer and make sure they're, they're happy and we're giving them the best drink that we possibly can, you know, and we want to give them that value and that experience. And that's, what really drives us, you know, is, is, is the customer and, you know, making sure they're having a completely novel and new experience. And we really want to capture and delight their imagination, you know? So that's, that's what our driving force. There's a lot of intentionality uh, in the things that you do, whether it's, you know, the, the clarification process, the sugar that you use, uh, this idea of labeling, um, the idea of using, you know, uh, metal uh, cans versus uh, plastic, that must all drive up the cost a lot, right? It does. It really, really does. Um, you know, every, all of our decision-making process is how we determine our spend is based off of our three values, right? Like diversity, equity, inclusion, sustainability, um, and, you know, practicing the art of of craft cocktails, you know, part of that sustainability, I, we feel is being transparent. And, um, that really goes towards, uh, our labeling and showing our ingredients on there. Um, you know, for example, one thing we're really proud of is like, and we're transparent with is the fact of the matter is, is to be completely shelf stable. We have to use a preservative, but we, we ended up investing in, uh, a plant-based preservative. I believe we might be the first company to do so, a beverage alcohol company, and not chemical stabilization, right? So 
the packaging itself, we chose aluminum cans um, just because of its recyclability percentage. Uh, you know, aluminum cans, like one can over like 90, over 98% of one aluminum can can be recycled mm -hmm. into the next aluminum can. There's not much material loss. Um, and it's also lightweight, you know, it doesn't let, it's opaque, no light comes in. So it really, it's a really great packaging format. And at the same time, um, we also invested in, in aluminum cans that do not have BPA in the liner. And there's only, at the time when we bought this, you know, uh, our inventory, like I think just one company was doing it, Ball, and I think there's more now. But yeah, that drives up the cost when you, when you seek that, that type of packaging out with those features. Um, and there was like aluminum can supply too. So there was, there was like issues with that around the global supply chain. I had no but idea yeah. there was BPAs and aluminum product, aluminum can products. Yeah, there is a very, very thin, um, clear liner on the inside of all aluminum cans. And um, yeah, we, in learning that, you know, we just practice our value. Okay, well, let's avoid the liners with BPA. <laughs> so that was the liner choice. For? What's the liner um, used for? It helps. Uh, it, it's definitely for all the various businesses, like people package all different types of liquids into aluminum cans. They have various pHs and uh, they also, there's trace like metal elements in many different types of uh, organic material that could have a negative reaction with a raw bare aluminum and cause corrosion and then the can will leak. So it's designed to prevent leakage. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of detail. Um, so when we talk about like going back to the whole pricing thing, um, is Vervet priced higher? Um, and if it is, like, how do you mitigate the sort of the consumer's decision to go with something cheaper? Or uh, is it something that is baked in into this idea of a premium product and people are just going to read it and go, okay, we'll rather buy at a higher price point and go with the better quality. I mean, is that something, is that a consideration in the way that you, you put the product out price-wise? Absolutely. And at, man, that is a conversation we talk about constantly. Um, right now we're $22 a four pack, you know, typically, and you know, it's five fifty for a drink, six bucks, but we feel this level of this quality of drink, we're bringing so much value. Um, to this product and i think in exchange for five five fifty or six bucks is the consumer is getting a lot of value you know i mean this same drink if you just made this at a bar it would take you two weeks you know and most craft cocktail bars would charge you know 18 bucks for it um i think for us like we're going to do our best job of being transparent and educating the consumer on everything that we're doing and it's going to be up to them if they're getting the value or not i mean it's this whole game is a game of assumptions and, um, you know, we are assuming that like for a premium cocktail uh, at $6 a can at 550 can is pretty fair. I mean, I think given the rise of cost, just raw materials, you know, we may be forced to increase the price a, a bit more, but, you know, part of the mission of the brand too is, you know, we're not just going for the one percent right like you know because of my experience growing up and i know what it's like growing up poor and still wanting to have really great products and you know great stuff in my life but you know we don't want to be too expensive where we exclude um you know large swaths of of people like that so we we try to be mindful of that pricing you know and making sure that it's it's it, it can work in, in most people's budget, but we do know we're expensive. Look, I, I'm going to, oh God, I don't want to be crucified for what I'm about to say, but you know, I can speak from my own cultural relative perspective, which is as a Vietnamese person, I'm kind of trained or kind of uh, forced into the path of buying things that are not, um, that are that are typically not at a higher price point and quality be damned right like if i ever saw a 30 dollar bowl of pho 
that would prevent me from going into that restaurant, you know, and, and this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with, um, you know, and I talk about this constantly. If you're cooking a bowl of pho and you're putting like a dollar or $2 per pound of bone per bowl, you're looking at a, you know, easily a $15 bowl of pho and the gas that's, you know, and the time that's, it's on the stove and it's cooking in a big pot. It drives the costs up, but you get all the gelatin and you get all of the the goodies that we cook at home and, and the quality is different. So Vervet is doing the same thing. It's you're providing basically a dollar bowl of pho, but culturally we have not moved. Look, I, I, I don't want to get crucified for this, but for the most part, the world has not moved beyond that um, for Vietnamese products. And we need to, we, we need to have the vervet way of thinking when we're approaching uh, Vietnamese foods. I mean, the whole world needs to see it that way. Um, so that's sort of my two cents always on this uh, direction. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, when, you know, obviously the Vietnamese population, we came here, most of us, if after the war, especially we were, oh, we were so impoverished and um, the decision-making process was based on one value cost <laughs> that's it you know now what that does uh in specifically what we're talking about here is food a bowl of pho what is going to happen you're going to if as a consumer you know you're like you know it's like no a bowl of pho should never be 30 dollars, let alone 15 right you know um what happens is for the business owner and operator, they have to make a living too. So what happened, they're going to have to take shortcuts. So they're not going to, you're not going to get that. You're going to get a bowl of pho, but it's going to have decisions in there that were based on economics, right? I mean, are they using bullion? Where are they taking their shortcuts? So it's like, it's you know, cubes. it's, it's, it's always cubes. Powder yeah, cubes. It's, absolutely. And, um, you know, eventually it's, it's up to us. You know, as as consumers, we vote with vote with our dollars and what we want to support. But I do think, um, which with each ensuing generation, you know, we're gonna we're gonna move that needle and we're gonna move that line of scrimmage, you know, um, to a different place. You know, I see, you know, you look at the early Italian immigrants and the cost of their food, and when that started becoming that started escalating to reflect the real value of right. labor and quality ingredients we saw the price go up and um larger culture really accepted it you know and embraced it you know right now here in la you know you could buy these 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 pasta products you know these from great chefs you know 30 40 dollars a plate you know but um shaolong bao or or ban gong you know which is so labor intensive you know it's you know our own community, and obviously that means the, the the outside community doesn't expect it, doesn't won't embrace it or support it. But that's changing, um, and it's based off of entrepreneurial spirit and creators coming into the space, and um, and leading the way. That, that's why if you're in a big city and you eat an eight dollar bowl of pho, you're 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 in dangerous red alert territory because eight dollars is buying you bullion. It's buying you powdered taste and you're buying decisions that are not good for your body uh, at an $8 bowl. Um, the minimum, I think it should be a $15 bowl of pho if they're doing it, you know, right. And even still in this market, in this day and age, $15 bowl of pho, you really can't get quality, I feel, because the cost of gas, the cost of rent, the cost of labor, the cost of bones, all of these things to produce this like vervet level product is um it's missing it's not going to happen no you're absolutely right and you know um just taking into the the hard facts of that that economic model you just presented absolutely 15 dollars is where it should be that's the cost of a bowl of ramen and uh Easily. ramen 18, is 18 20 for a bowl of ramen yeah it's very labor intensive multiple days if you're really practicing it um in, in the way that it could be where it would provide the best experience. It's you can't get around the time investment, you know, that it takes in all the number of ingredients and just the human effort of watching it and, you know, and as it goes along and 
And then there's all the other components too, as well, that go into it. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, what we need but, to do, we need to have this like massive pho pot made of glass. And then you have like a display where you can put two or three of these pots on and just dump like 20, 30 pounds of bone. So people can see the actual bone on the fire cooking. And then you can charge 30 bucks for her. Cause you know, that's really where the money's at is that gelatinous uh, extract that's happening while you're having this eight to 12 hour, you know, boil. No, that's right. And you, that's how you can tell really good pho broth. You can, you know, pucker your lips and you should feel a little bit of a yeah. gelatin that, that kind of a little bit of stickiness. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. Or the other thing is you just have smaller portions, you know, uh, if, you know, if you're going to want to charge a eight, ten dollar bowl, bowl, you can just reduce the size, you know. Um, but yeah, it's very, very challenging, I think, for next gen to, to who have such interest in our food culture and balancing that price point. Um, and because like most people, they don't want to exclude anyone, you know, um, especially the older generation. And uh, we don't want to be repel them, you know, but our community, you know, our income earning, you know, that's, that's a larger conversation, right? For historically excluded groups, we don't have that generational wealth yet. We don't have that quite privilege as some of us do. Um, but once, you know, we start getting that critical mass and historically excluded groups can increase uh, their, their income and wealth, and we can really support creators like this. I'm gonna transition over to Korean and Vietnamese culture uh, from food. So when you look at, because you are of mixed heritage, when you look at the Korean flag and the Vietnamese flag, um, and I don't mean any North or South Vietnamese flag, but just the flag in general, you know, a flag that represents uh, whichever side you're from and the Korean flag, uh, what, what kind of emotions are going through your mind? Wow, oh my gosh, okay. Um... There's so much, and it's something I truly think about every day. I really, truly do. Uh, the two countries have such similar histories when it comes to the last century, but the outcome of the main struggle is completely different. You know, um, in Korea, we got to see the the democratic capitalist side and ideology win through a struggle of war, right? Um, and that was fought out over that. In Vietnam, the other, it went the other way, um, where the ideology led by China, you know, I guess communist um, ideology is, is what prevailed. So the outcomes couldn't have been different, even though they started similarly, you know, um, in, these, in these civil wars, but what that means is, uh, for me, I think about our, I guess, our, our two flags, you know, we know the, the flag of South Vietnam, yellow background, three red stripes, and the other flag, the current flag uh, of the country of Vietnam accepted by the global community, red background, yellow star. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that either of those flags represent me. And so I, I don't rep them. You know, in, in fact, I think it in, in my pitch deck, you know, like it, when it's like the meet the team slide, you know, it, it has my flags, it has the Korean flag. Um, and the um, and the other flag for Vietnam, it just says made in Vietnam. So it's because, uh, you know, I think the, the values of of that, the, the, the flag right now of the, the government that's that's in power, you know, the values of that don't fully represent me. So for me as personally, um, and it's different, I think, for all Vietnamese uh, Americans and also and all Vietnamese in the diaspora. Certainly, um, Very different. it's different for everyone. Um, but, you know, they don't represent my values. So I can't, I can't really return it. I can't, I can't represent that. Um, the, the yellow background with the three red stripes, you know, that flag was our flag growing up, right? And, um, but it's evolved and changed over the years. You know, I think seeing that flag pop up in some of our different political groups, 
you know, that don't represent my values, but it it showed up so powerfully and so strongly, you know, uh, particularly at the insurrection, that was, that was hard for me personally. So, um, and what that sort of flag stands for now, but you know, that can change. I feel like that flag can, can, can change, you know? Um, so again, that's a work in progress, but right now I'm not representing that flag, but that can change. But the Korean flag for you, there's a, a certain, you know, when I think about flags, sometimes the symbolic list of bullets uh and i don't mean like gun bullets but i mean like a bullet point you know there's kpis that when you look at a certain flag you're just like automatically intuitively you have these kpis like oh that that checks off that checks off that checks off you know there has to be some sort of ev uh bullet point checklist that that evokes a certain approval uh that happens for you um with the flags that you 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 see because uh it's it's not black or white but i'm sure that there is some sort of association with some indicators that uh indexes that you feel uh, on an on an intuitive level can you talk about that yeah yeah absolutely um yeah i mean i think the united nations uses something the human development index you know it's, it's based on some factors of kind of how they they rank in, in sort countries, you know, um, Korea ranks pretty high on that and, and Vietnam doesn't. Um, and, you know, their list, you know, I think that kind of includes, um, you know, everything from life expectancy, education, earning power of, of each individual. And they kind of collate all that information together. And, you know, I think that's just one little group of KPIs. Um, and, you know, I think that's, I care about our country so much and I care about its success. I'm invested and I'm always going to celebrate the culture, you know, but I want to see that applied to our people. And um, there's right now, there's just such a lack of evidence there. I mean, listen, I think both of us have traveled to Vietnam. You can, you see it with your own eyes, you know, um, and I've been to Korea and it's very different. Um, you know, and I think Korea can be an inspiration to Vietnam because in three generations, they've achieved the level of success, financial success and cultural success in three generations. That's very, very impressive in a very short amount of time. Um, and it was a very intentional plan. It was very, you know, they had a great plan and, and a, a roadmap, you know, to victory. Um, and, you know, I, I, I of course, seeing the, the, the Vietnam is what it's very different. It couldn't the, the two countries could not be different. You know, Korea went from one of the top below, you know, uh, bottom 10 in, in poorest countries uh, to where it is now. Um, but there is I continually, I follow, you know, news coming out of Vietnam and there's like an, a lot of amazing efforts going on. So while it may not happen in three generations, I mean, it will happen at its own pace, but I, I hopefully it, it will continue to do so. And that structures are in place within that country where that, that wealth, cultural wealth and financial wealth is distributed in an equitable way yeah. that's meaningful, that really brings the floor up if we are struggling to do that here in the United States, I mean, you know, I think all around the world, it's, it's a problem. It's a universal problem. Yes, it is. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it definitely is. So yeah, we're struggling with it here. Um, so that's why whatever, you know, happens there, I fully understand the challenges. Speaking of challenges, um, what is the critical marker for you uh, with Vervet? Uh, in terms of distribution, like, are you past that magical sort of, uh, you know, success point where you're like, okay, the brand's good on its own, you don't have to worry much, or are you just starting out and you have these milestones? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. No, the we have not um, crossed that threshold. I, you know, I don't know when we will, and uh, but we're going to. I, I, you know, I. The team is really great. My co-founders are really wonderful. And we, you know, continually, I think month on month, 
uh, people learn about us and, and we get more supporters. Um, you know, making sure that, you know, just Americans and, you know, we're going to start here in Los Angeles in, in the city, which is, which is huge to make sure that we're available and people know about us. So one of those things is making sure that we have really great uh, retail partners, you know, uh, like Whole Foods or Erewhon or Gelson's and just, you know, making sure that we're out there because we can't do it on our own. So it's, we really, it's allyship partnership, right? So it's, that's really what it is. We really need these key partnerships and we're working towards that. And I think we're getting close. Um, and I think that's really going to help get our brand out there and what we're doing, our brand values and our product values. And we're doing our own effort. We're lucky enough to have our own online store. Now, finally, it is a little complicated to do, um, but people can experience the brand and the products that way. And we try to make it as affordable as possible. Um, oh, you, but, you can ship alcohol uh, online now? Yeah, to 41 states. We have uh, an e-com partner that we need to do because we're heavily regulated industry. So they are the compliance partner. Um, so yeah, as a beverage alcohol, we just can't set up our own Shopify and start shipping. Right, out. right. So oh, yeah, we, we have this e-commerce partner uh, that manages the compliance. What, what's the hardest part of this journey? scaling is everything is painful. Um, you know, I think um, growing our distribution partners is very, very hard. You just have to have a lot of patience because the larger the retail partner and the impact they can have on growing your company, they have a big process. There's a lot of people involved and you just have to be willing to be patient. So that's a very challenging mm -hmm. thing is being patient. Most entrepreneurs, we are not, you know. Um, yeah, you're right. We want to get it done now. To yesterday, you know? yeah. That's exactly right. So that's the, probably the hardest thing to do is, is being patient. Um, and that's hard. Uh, but, you know, there's always costing issues, typical pain points, rising costs and lead times. Um, production is, our production is challenging just because, of the multiple steps involved and the time and, and labor and uh, quality control. But, you know, we're getting better at it. Like each time we do it, we, we are able to um, economize our operations and be able to, to streamline that process more. Thank you so much for really opening up um, all of the details of your life and the way you see the world and the product that you're bringing out into the world. Um, I hope that you and I both have the grit to get back on in the next five years and constantly touch base and talk about cultural issues and this uh, radical okayness and where we're going with the with with the um, Asian American sort of existing um, in the bigger bigger picture. And um, thank you so much again. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. This, it was wonderful having this conversation with you. Thank you. Great, talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran and Javier Proenza. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Crystal Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts. Thanks again for listening.